The night sky, the dark blanket above our heads adorned with shining stars extending as far as the eye can see. One of the most appealing and mystifying of all sights. The beauty and the majesty of the universe have inspired awe and reverence in the best brains throughout history. There is a perfect brain behind all the natural physical laws. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of a powerful and intelligent being. Please describe the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? Many millennia ago, an advanced civilization revealed the mystery of the origin and nature of the cosmos. The term Vedic refers to the civilization of ancient India. Angkor Wat, the world's largest temple complex, with walls nearly one half mile on each side, was built between 1112 and 1150 AD in Cambodia. Astronomy and Vedic cosmology are inseparably entwined at Angkor Wat. The central towers represent Mount Meru, the cosmic axial mountain. The five internested rectangular outer walls and moats indicate chains of mountains enclosing the world and the cosmic oceans beyond. Science Journal noted that Angkor Wat had encoded precise calendrical, historical, and cosmological themes into the architectural plan for the temple. As many as 18 astronomical alignments have been identified within its walls. Rarely in history has any culture given rise to a structure that so elaborately and expansively incorporates its concept of the cosmos. Similar integration of cosmology and architecture is seen in the massive Indonesian temple at Borobudur. The temple was laid out using the ancient method of Vastu Purusha Mandala. This square diagram harmonizes architecture with the annual movements of the celestial realm. The temple was constructed sometime around 775 A.D. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, also known as Srila Prabhupada, author of 84 books on Vedic knowledge and founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and the Bhaktivedanta Institute. He desired to erect the world's largest planetarium depicting Vedic cosmology through modern technology. He hoped that this gigantic virtual 3D animated model would give the contemporary world access to the Vedic cosmos. The Temple of Vedic Planetarium, that's what we shall show the basic conception of planetary system within this material world and above the material world. Vishvanandana Swami, a prominent scholar of Vedic cosmology in the line of Sripad Madhvacharya, feels that the planetarium will expand the horizons of modern cosmological knowledge. We have a lot of information about this universe in our uh, Vedic and Puranic scriptures. So certainly, a person who is interested in exploration, he would be, he would get some material for exploration. The planetarium had many different exhibits, so he wanted some exhibits that would show, that would create this doubt in the in science that they don't have the proper explanation, and that the Bhagavatam has a better explanation. In the temple. 
and that you know it would show the Vedic cosmology. Mm. And I think later on he said that even if the scientists don't accept it, we don't care. You know, we just show what's in the Bhagavatam. We don't care whether people accept it or not, but we should just show it. In a letter to Bhakti Swarup Damodar Swami, Srila Prabhupada delineated four phenomena to be explained in the planetarium. Explain the passing seasons, mm. the eclipses and the phases of the moon, and the passing of day and night, etc. Then it will be a very powerful propaganda. The literature of that period contains a wealth of cosmological knowledge encoded in Sanskrit, arguably the world's oldest language. This knowledge has the potential to enrich our understanding of the cosmos we live in. A fundamental principle of Vedic cosmology is the existence of a dual reality, material and non-material. Here we see the non-material sky filled with innumerable planets of permanent stature. Among these, the topmost planet, Goloka, is shaped like a lotus flower and it is here that the super-intelligent designer of the cosmos, Sri Krishna, resides with his associates. Although knowledge of the non-material realm remains beyond ordinary perception, the Vedic knowledge of the material cosmos has been recognized as extraordinary by many eminent Western thinkers. As in Hindu mythology, it is a continual dance of creation and destruction involving the whole cosmos, the basis of all existence and of all natural phenomena. Long before it became a scientific aspiration to estimate the age of the earth, many elaborate systems of the world chronology had been devised by the sages of antiquity. The most remarkable of these occult timescales is that of the ancient Hindus. Indian cosmologists, the first to estimate the age of the earth at more than four billion years, they came closest to the modern ideas of atomism, quantum physics. To the philosophers of India, however, relativity is no new discovery. Just as the concept of light years is no matter for astonishment to people used to thinking of time in millions of kalpas. A kalpa is about 4,320,000 years. The Hindu religion is the only one of the world's great faiths dedicated to the idea that the cosmos itself undergoes an immense, indeed an infinite, number of deaths and rebirths. Thus the Vedic literatures answer the question whether the cosmos always existed or it had a beginning. The temporal arena of repeated universal creations and destructions exists in a corner of the non-material sky. This material nature which is one of my energies, is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, producing all moving and non-moving beings. Under its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. The only religion in which the time scales correspond, no doubt by accident, to those of modern scientific cosmology. Its cycles run from our ordinary day and night to a day and night of Brahma. 8.64 billion years long, longer than the age of the Earth or the Sun, and about half the time since the Big Bang. And there are much longer time scales still. The material universe works on the principle of relative time. As such, a day of Brahma equals 8.64 billion years by earthly calculation. 
since Brahma has passed half of his lifetime thus far. The age of our universe turns out to be approximately 155 trillion years. After another Brahma century, he stirs, recomposes himself, and begins again to dream the great cosmic lotus dream. Here we behold a form of the superintelligent being Vishnu reclining in mystic slumber amid the causal ocean. When he exhales, millions of universes issue from his body and expand until he inhales when all the universes return within him. The universe is a sphere encased by successive coverings of the elements earth, water, fire, air, ether, intelligence, and ego. As a coconut has its hard outer shell and inner liquid, so the universe has its outer coverings and an inner space half filled with ocean water. On that ocean another Vishnu expansion reclined on a serpent bed while being massaged by his consort Lakshmi. From his navel arose a lotus on which Brahma was born. Initially the universe was pitch dark and Brahma engaged in meditation. Then he was empowered to create the universe. This account of creation may appear fantastic to some, but modern scientific theories also require fantastic leaps of faith to explain the origin of the universe. This is evident from the words of eminent physicist Stephen Hawking. Either we have failed to see 99% of the universe, or we are wrong about how the universe began. Vedic cosmology explains that the universe is made up of 14 vertically arranged planetary systems, or lokas. Each system resembles a galaxy and comprises stars, planets, and other celestial bodies. The topmost planetary system is Satyaloka, the abode of Brahma, which is at a height of 1.87 billion miles above Earth. Below this Satyaloka planetary system is the Tapaloka planetary system, the abode of the ascetics, which is at a height of nearly 1 billion miles above the Earth. Here, the ascetics live in a solitary, serene environment conducive for yoga and meditation on transcendence. Their disciplined life of joyous austerity prepares them for returning back to the non-material world. As we move down from Tapaloka, we pass through Maharloka and Janaloka until we reach the Svargaloka planetary system, also known as Heaven. The alignment of heavenly bodies around the pole star was elucidated by Srila Prabhupada in a letter. We can see that at night, how the whole planetary system is turning around. And the pole star being the pivot is planet as its orbit fixed, but the sun is moving up and down, north and south. It is not that we shall accept the theory that the sun is fixed, and others are all going around the sun. That is not correct. In talks with leading disciples, Srila Prabhupada compared the revolution of planets and stars to a spectacular rotating chandelier. It's like this chandelier, and so all the whole thing is moving. And then he developed this idea of the temple of the Vedic planetarium and how he wanted, he'd always go like this, dom, dom. He'd hold his hand like that. And he'd say, and then from the center of the dome, a chandelier, uh, which shows the planets according to the Vedic version. Mm -hmm. Some spectacular kind of chandelier. He's bland and he's his star. He's the rotating. On his forehead, and it is hanging like the chandelier, taking shelter of the pole star, as we can see every night. 
that the pole star or the North Star remains fixed and does not orbit in the sky is well known to astronomers and sailors alike. Less known is the fact that the pole star rotates powerfully on its own axis. The ancient Vedic text called Matsya Purana explains, The planets and stars are all attached to the pole star by invisible astral cords of wind called pravaha. The revolution of the pole star causes the orbital motion of other planets and stars. Through meditation, yogic astronomers visualize the planets and stars as different parts of the body of Shishumar, the transcendental dolphin. The Pole Star The topmost of the heavenly planets is like the capital of the middle universe. Here, the third form of Vishnu resides on an ocean of milk. In times of universal disturbances, the demigods headed by Brahma come here to appeal for help. The Pole Star is also the abode of Dhruva, a pure and exalted devotee of the Lord. Now let's look at the workings of our solar system. The mainstream scientific notion has been to portray the solar system as heliocentric or sun-centered. In the Vedic geocentric model, the sun, planets, and constellations revolve around the earth in an approximately 24-hour period. What may surprise many is that a geocentric or earth-centered model is also capable of explaining the cosmic phenomenon with equal if not better accuracy, as is confirmed by many eminent scientists. Either CS could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different CS. We know that the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only and that such a difference has no physical significance. Obviously it matters little if we think of the earth as turning about on its axis or if we view it at rest while the fixed stars revolve around it. Geometrically these are exactly the same case of a relative rotation of the earth and the fixed stars with respect to one another. Although the heliocentric model has been widely propagated, it has never been proven. There is no planetary observation by which we on earth can prove that the earth is moving in an orbit around the sun. Mathematically, there is nothing wrong in this system because we are observing from the earth and it is the relative motion that really matters. So if you assume that the sun goes around the earth, there is nothing wrong because it's a question of relative motion. The Vedas give amazing information about the sun. Do you know what energy runs the sun? Is it nuclear fusion? Is it volcanic energy? The Vedas say it is water. Yes, water. The sun evaporates water from all over the creation and uses it as fuel, just as lightning uses moisture. Modern science knows that sunlight contains many types of rays, such as ultraviolet, infrared, gamma rays, x-rays, etc. The Vedas describe that sunlight contains 100,000 different types of rays, each possessing specific subtle properties. Just as in a house, electricity regulates coolness, heat, light, sound, etc., so the sun's rays control heat and cold, day and night, summer and winter, darkness and light throughout the universe. The Vedic geocentric model explains how the sun moves around the pole star situated vertically above Earth's north pole. As the sun goes around the earth globe, we experience day and night. The stationary earth, unlike the pole star, does not revolve on its own axis, though it is slightly tilted toward the pole star. 
During summer in the Northern Hemisphere, the North Pole experiences six months of daylight. Conversely, during summer in the Southern Hemisphere, the South Pole experiences six months of daylight. These six-month periods correspond to a day and night for the demigods living in the heavenly planetary system. Vedic cosmology accounts for this phenomena by the vertical motion of the sun, technically called Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. The sun moves upward on an incline for half a year and then downward for the next half. This motion produces two effects on Earth, namely the changing of the seasons and the varying durations of day and night. Ordinary vision sees the sun to be a mere globe of fire. However, celestial vision reveals a personality residing over the sun. His name is Vivisvan, and he rides on a golden chariot pulled by seven divine horses at a speed of 16,000 miles per second. The chariot has one wheel which moves on celestial Manasotara mountain. The horizontal shaft is linked to the axial hub of the universe, Mount Meru, and the diagonal shaft is linked to the pole star. With each circular path, the wheel gradually moves laterally inward for six months and then outward for six months. Similar to the chariot's vertical motion, this lateral action fine-tunes seasonal changes on Earth. When the orbital motion of the sun is viewed from above, its illumination is seen to extend out to half of the greater Earth plane. During its orbit, the sun passes over the four cities situated in the four cardinal directions. The city over which the sun is passing experiences noon, and the city in the opposite direction experiences midnight. The two other cities experience sunrise and sunset. The zodiac is a conceptual celestial plate encompassing the entire sky. Like the face of a clock, the zodiac is divided into 12 divisions of 30 degrees each, called signs of the zodiac, or rashis. Each named according to the constellation of stars residing within them, these signs serve as a set of reference markers for measuring the movements of the moon, sun, and the planets. The zodiac completes one clockwise revolution of 360 degrees in every 24-hour period. The moon travels through the zodiac, but due to its slower angular velocity, it completes only about 347 degrees in 24 hours, falling behind by about 13 degrees. The day after the new moon day, we see one moon phase. The next day, the moon again completes 347 degrees, and we see the moon in its second phase. In this way, the moon appears to travel in the opposite direction through the zodiac. This is also called retrograde motion. Thus, the phases of the moon increase each day for 15 days until the full moon. Then the moon's phases decrease gradually by one phase each day until the dark moon night. The Srimad Bhagavatam describes the vertical positions of the planetary orbits. First above the earth plane is the sun at a height of 0.8 million miles. Next higher comes the moon at 1.6 million miles, followed by the nakshatras, 28 stars, at twice the height, then Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Saptarishi constellation, and then finally the pole star at a height of 30.4 million miles. Although the sun is 0.8 million miles above the earth plane, its horizontal distance from the earth is much greater. Although varying with the seasons, the mean earth-sun distance works out to be approximately 100 million miles. 80,000 miles below the sun is a dark or invisible planet named 
Rahu. When this planet comes between Earth and the Sun on the new moon day, or Amavasya, while the moon is in the same conjunction or straight line, a solar eclipse takes place. The eclipse is full for those on Earth who are situated in line with the conjunction while others may see it partially. Similarly, when Rahu comes between the Earth and the Moon on the full moon day, or Purnima, while the Sun is in the same conjunction, a lunar eclipse takes place. This is seen by anyone on Earth who can see the Moon. The eclipse is either full or partial depending on the movement of Rahu. At least 5,000 years ago, the Vedas were able to predict eclipses precisely. This science is still used today with the same extraordinary accuracy. Science is defined as a systematized knowledge of things around us. So if we prove that Vedic cosmology is systematized knowledge, that would uh, prove in other words scientific nature of uh, Vedic cosmology. Modern uh, cosmic science is only a few centuries old, whereas our Vedic cosmology is uh, several thousands of years old. So the modern sci science ca certainly cannot be a base for uh, ancient uh, Vedic cosmology. Vedic cosmology presented from the Vaishnava point of view and as based on the Vedas, we'll find appreciation by real scientists because it has its own scientific basis. Science has always changed over the centuries. One theory after the other has come and replaced the former theory. And what is prevalent, everyone has accepted. But Vedanta doesn't change. Do you say that uh, these modern scientists have found out everything in this universe? They have not uh, explored all the possibilities in the field of cosmology. Only they have explored to some extent. They have seen through this Nalika Yantra or the uh, uh, telescopes and microscopes, etc., which are having their own limitations. And people uh, getting the information through limited devices, can they say they know everything? I don't agree with this particular point at all. Kepler put sun at a distance of 30 million miles from uh, Earth, but the modern scientists placed the same Earth at a distance of 93 million miles. In 1930, Pluto came into existence. 2006, it vanished. To realize the vision of the Vedic planetarium, Srila Prabhupada wanted a diagram depicting the structure of the universe. To this end, he engaged devotees and artists in drawing maps according to Srimad Bhagavatam. Those three, and I was doing maps, we had some big pieces of paper, and then after this, I was there for discussions, and uh, I would take some notes, and then try to make these maps. They were present sometimes while I was making the maps, other times I would make the maps on my own. And I really, I only think there were about three or four maps from Pumandala. But, uh, so I made this one big, big map. One of the maps was the concentric overview of Bumangala. Simultaneously, Srila Prabhupada sent out leading students to find a competent Vedic astronomer. After extensive searching throughout India, finally on April 30th, 1977, a reputed South Indian pundit was brought to Bombay, India to meet Srila Prabhupada. In the fifth canto, there is a description of the planetary system. Yes, sir. So, we want the diagram. Yes, sir. So, kindly help us. This planetary system is hanging. Yes. Urdha Mula Dosaka. Same thing is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes. How it is hanging and where I define the situation of the planets and Plato's and uh, so, as far as the book is concerned, uh, kindly make a drive so that you shall exhibit. Because uh, uh, I'm not 
more difficult for the day making on some other things. And during that summer of 77, Prabhupada had a lot of meetings with him and Tamal Krishna Maharaj uh, to discuss how to do this Vedic planetarium. And they actually sent people out, they tried to get people from South India. There was a lot of effort that was made, you know, to try to get a good concept of how to present it. But they couldn't find anybody who was able to do it, at least not to Prabhupada's satisfaction. So it was one of the things that Prabhupada left with us. Srila Prabhupada's desire for the diagram was not to go unfulfilled. That elusive map was discovered by Srila Prabhupada's disciples at the holy village of Melakote, some 50 kilometers north of Mysore, Karnataka in India. This diagram accurately depicted the entire cosmology of Srimad Bhagavatam in an ingenious yet simple rendering. The person through whom it was revealed to the world was the 19th century scholar saint Tiruvenkata Ramanuja G.R. Swami. Born in Sri Purumbudur, Tamil Nadu, Tiruvenkata Swami went on to become an Acharya or spiritual leader in the preceptorial line known as the Sri Sampradaya. He spent several years of his life in Melakote, which 900 years earlier had been the residence place of Sripad Ramanuja Acharya, the most prominent Acharya of the Sri Sampradaya. At Melakote, in the thousand-year-old temple, Tiruvenkata Swami studied and taught the Vedas and also worshipped the deity of Tiru Cheluva Narayan. One day, while studying the Mahabharata, a 5,000 year old epic of ancient India, he came across some intriguing verses. In the fifth chapter of Jambu Kanda, Bhishma Parva of Mahabharata, it is said Sudarshanam Pravakshami Dvipastu Guru Nandana Parimandalo Maharaja Dvipoyam Chakra Samstita this Bharat Kanda is called Sudarshana Dvip, since it looks beautiful to the eyes of the onlookers. Being circular, it looks like the disk of the Lord and it is attached to cyclic time in the form of a disk presided over by Lord Sudarshana. Bharat Kanda is in the form of a globe since all of its four corners are rounded like the bale fruit. When viewed from the moon, half of Bharat Kanda appears like the rabbit and a small people leaf, while the other half appears in the form of a big people leaf with all of them surrounded by varieties of vegetation. Pondering the verses, he became perplexed. What on earth can a rabbit and people leaves have to do with geography or cosmography? As he sought to understand their meaning, he contemplated, meditated, and prayed. Finally, by divine inspiration, 
He sketched a drawing of the rabbit and the people leaves, but still remained mystified about their connection with the Earth's geography. Suddenly it dawned on him that if the drawing was turned upside down, the rabbit perfectly corresponded with Europe, Asia, and Africa, while the people leaves corresponded with North America, South America, and Australia. These continents comprise our Earth, which the Mahabharat calls Bharatkanda. Vishnu Purana also describes the Earth as Bharatkanda and gives its diameter as 8,000 miles. The Earth is also referred to by the name Bharatkanda in the invocation Sankalpa Mantra chanted by Brahmana priests since time immemorial up until the present day. Vedic cosmology gives descriptions of the entire cosmos including its subtle features. Perception and access to these subtle features, however, requires karmic qualification. Consequently, much of the cosmos described earlier, as well as parts of the cosmography about to be described, are imperceptible and inaccessible to us earthly inhabitants. Bharat Kanda is one of the nine islands of the larger and originally bow-shaped Bharat Varsha, which was divided by the sons of Sagara. Being completely surrounded by water, the islands are mutually unreachable. In the Vedas, Bharat Kanda, our Earth, is also referred to by other names such as Sudarshan Dvip, Kumarika Dvip, and Navadvip, etc. The famous mountains known as the Himalayas are tall and immovable. Here we find an abode of Lord Shiva, the greatest of the demigods. In the center of Jambu Dvip stands the most extraordinary divine golden mountain called Meru. Meru is shaped like an inverted cone and it is the sporting place for the demigods. Around Meru are many supporting mountains called Kesara. Jambu Dvipa is 0.8 million miles in diameter and is surrounded by the saltwater ocean of the same width. On top of Mount Meru is a resort of Brahma called Manovati. The famous celestial river Ganges descends to the center of Manovati and then flows out into four directions. Surrounding Manovati in the eight directions are the resort cities of the chief demigods. One of these cities is Amaravati the resort of Indra, king of heaven. King Indra lives here in majestic opulence attended to by musicians, dancers, and reciters. This is what you call as Brahma Sadhana, the place of the palace. Knowledge of Meru and the cosmography of the greater earth has been preserved and taught carefully by learned scholars in the preceptorial line known as the Madhva Sampradaya. The greater earthly planetary system extends out to the edges of the universe and has a diameter of 4 billion miles. Known as Bhumandala, shaped like a lotus flower, it has seven concentric islands and oceans with Mount Meru as its pericarp.
The seven oceans respectively contain salt water, sugarcane juice, liquor, clarified butter, milk, emulsified yogurt, and sweet drinking water. Sometimes Vedic cosmology is misconstrued as portraying the earth to be a flat disk. This flat earth misconception arises partly due to our inability to understand Vedic nomenclature. A single object may be referred to by several names, and a single name may refer to several objects. For example, the term earth may be used to describe at least six different aspects of cosmology. The earth we live on is indeed a globe as explained by the Sanskrit word parimandale, meaning spherical, used in the Mahabharata text. The flat disk refers to the greater earthly planetary system of Bhumandala. Four elephants of inestimable size are placed at the four directions for balancing the greater earth. Below the earthly planetary system are seven subterranean realms named Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and Patala, which do not receive sunlight and which are inhabited primarily by demoniac living entities. To reach the first one, one must go 80,000 miles downward through underground tunnels. At successive depths of 80,000 miles are the remaining six nether worlds, all of which are fully developed underground civilizations. In the fourth level downward, Talatala Loka, lives the magical architect Maya Danava, who has designed many brilliantly decorated cities where proud materialists reside. Below the nether worlds are the 28 hellish planetary systems. The demigod of justice, Yamaraj, judges the unrighteous human beings after their deaths and sends them to one of these planets. There, errant souls are administered appropriate punitive measures corresponding to their misdeeds. The earthly and subterranean planetary systems rest upon one of the hoods of the gigantic divine serpent, Shesha. Shesha in turn is held up by the colossal transcendental tortoise, Kurma. And Kurma resides in the ocean that fills half the universe. stalwarts in Kerala, like uh, Madhava, who gave infinite series formulae for uh, sine, cosine, pi, nearly two centuries before Newton was born to teach calculus to the world. Albert Einstein also recognized the contribution of Vedic mathematics to science. We owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count, without which no worthwhile discovery could have been made. Vedic cosmological knowledge is revealed in two primary texts, namely the Puranas and the Jyotisha. Among the Jyotisha texts, the Surya Siddhanta is prominent and gives precise mathematical formulae for calculating planetary motions. The Surya Siddhanta contains extraordinary astronomical calculations which predate modern science itself. However, many contemporary scholars have been unable to understand Puranic cosmology. Nevertheless, detailed studies of both texts show that their foundational astronomical principles are identical. For instance, both calculate atomic time as the time it takes for the sun to pass over an atom. Similarly, both texts calculate the frequency of planetary revolutions in terms of their retrograde motion with respect to the zodiac. Furthermore, the apparent contradictions between the two texts 
are resolved by using the formula for converting the actual distances recorded in the Puranas into angular velocity stated in the Jyotisha. This Surya Siddhanta, originally spoken ages ago by Surya, the sun god, was translated and commented upon in the 20th century by the brilliant astronomer named Bhimala Prasad Siddhanta Sarasvati. The Vedic thought should be preserved. If you are not able to interpret, someone will interpret at a later stage. After a millennium, let someone come and interpret. I have to preserve that. The Vedic thought, Vedic knowledge has to flow from generation to generation. I feel that there should be a planetarium strictly according to Vedic cosmology. And once the planetarium is constructed, probably at least we will give a chance to those people to comment upon it and uh, to discard it or to accept it, etc. Vedic planetarium uh, apparently differ, appears to be different from the ideas of the modern scientists. But what is more important is whether Vedic planetarium idea by itself is scientific. If it is scientific, the modern scientists will have to revise their ideas about their own planetarium. At least planetary is required on all these things. You know, a vast knowledge of the universe and so much for so many people. So you are only, you are the only, not only the person to enjoy, you will allow all others to know about it. So that is really a commendable work and has to be done. It's a concept of planetarium, akayan to our Bhagavatam. So a Westerner who is wise and who is uh, after uh, discovery, certainly he will be interested in this. There is a famous proverb. One figure is worth a thousand words. I think I can extend this proverb. One model is worth a thousand figures. <laughs> Even if you put a number of figures, you will not uh, get the uh, correct uh, picture. So if you, if you consider a three-dimensional model, then certainly you can uh, perceive things better. Albert Brush Ford the great-grandson of automobile magnet Henry Ford speaks about how he became involved with the Vedic planetarium. I uh, was in Detroit in 1976. We had purchased the Bhakti Vedanta Cultural Center and uh, had spent uh, a year getting it fixed up and Prabhupada came for a visit. And so it was his first visit there and he was uh, entertaining some guests up in his room at the Cultural Center. And he was explaining to them about the Vedic planetarium. And so after he talked to them for a while, he turned to me and he said, uh, so how do you like this idea about the Vedic planetarium? And I said, that's a very nice idea, so probably because it sounds like a very interesting idea. And so he said, kind of half jokingly, okay, you can help finance. You know, and then we all laughed, myself and some of the other devotees had to laugh. But just at that moment, someone took a picture. So I had at home, I have that picture sitting on my desk. So at that moment, Prabhupada planted the seed that I should be involved in helping to finance the Temple of Vedic Planetarium. So 30 years later, here I am.